Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the CFRA webinar, Real Estate Investment Trust, uh, Road to Recovery. This is our fourth se session rounding out that theme. I'm Ken Leon, Director of Equity Research, also real estate analyst and bank analyst. With me, I'm delighted to have Chris Kuyper, uh, who's our Vice President, Industry Analyst covering consumer finance and the REITs, and Keith Snyder, our Technology Analyst, but also covers specialized REITs uh, related to wireless towers and data centers. Next. So today's agenda, we took out about CFRI mostly because we have so much great content to provide to you on ways to invest uh, in the REIT sector. Um, we're going to talk about performance and diversification, and then we're going to toggle down to seven REIT property types fundamentals and outlook, and then we'll certainly want to take your Q&A. Please take advantage of chat uh, that's available for this webinar, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. So with that, let me turn it over to Chris. Good morning. Morning. Thank you, Ken, and thank you everyone for joining. Uh, before we delve into those specific REIT property types, uh, it's helpful just to refresh ourselves, you know, why REITs and what makes them unique and a unique value proposition to a portfolio. Uh, so for the financial advisors on the line uh, who have a lot of retirees as their clients, uh, you're probably familiar with the old adage, cows for their milk, bees for their honey, and dividends for their cash flow. And this is really the one thing which makes REITs so attractive to a lot of people, especially retirees or related funds like pensions or endowments. Uh, because REITs have to pay out at least 90% of their income as a dividend every year, they're really like a bond proxy in most years. Uh, however, you have on top of that kind of this equity kicker where you've got the opportunity to uh, get some price appreciation as well. And we've seen talented REIT management companies uh, really take advantage of this. They know how to recycle their capital. They know how to reposition their properties or enhance the value of their properties. And so you can see some significant price appreciation as well. Uh, in fact, REITs have outperformed the S&P 500 over the past 25 years on a total return basis. And they've also outperformed corporate bonds. Uh, there's a lot of talk nowadays about fintech and about democratizing finance, getting people uh, exposure to different asset classes, especially people with smaller portfolios that uh, didn't have access to some of these products. And I think it's just really interesting because REITs were arguably one of the first big uh, steps in the democratization of finance all the way back in the, to the 70s and 80s when they kind of came about. Uh, REITs give almost anyone access to the real estate asset class with the ability to buy fractional ownership. Uh, they get true passive ownership. They don't have to manage the properties. They don't have to take on a lot of the risks. And then they get uh, excellent liquidity so they can easily rebalance or sell uh, when they need to uh, access that liquidity uh, for whatever purposes that they might have. And then finally, diversification. Uh, not only does this add a hard asset to the portfolio, but that then uh, reduces volatility because REITs have a pretty low correlation to other asset classes. And then we'll talk specifically too about how REITs can protect in an inflationary environment. Uh, but first going on to the next slide, just looking at REIT performance. Uh, you know, I updated this chart, uh, you know, just for this presentation. And unfortunately, I, I saw a lot of uh, underperformance in the most recent years. This used to be looking at this chart, you had outperformance in almost every time frame. Uh, with the, the recent coronavirus sell-off, however, that, that performance has been impacted a little. But the key takeaway here is that REITs still perform over an entire market cycle. So you have to look at peak to trough or peak to peak from the entire market cycle. And on that basis, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, and almost really 40 years, REITs have outperformed uh, the S&P 500 on a total return basis. Uh, finally, REITs and inflation I mentioned, uh, you know, this is definitely a topic of mine lately as gold has started to creep up, as the tips have started to go up. Uh, so I actually took at the last really high inflationary environment that we've seen in the, in the U.S., so early 70s to mid 80s. And here you can see on the chart, REITs did underperform as inflation started taking off. Uh, and the reason for this is a lot of tenants have long-term contracts in place, five, seven, even 10 years or more. And those contracts 
only have, you know, moderate re uh, rent escalators in them, you know, the typical two or three percent per year as inflation has generally run. So if you get high inflation, they might underperform initially. But as you can see in this chart, by uh, 1980, consumer prices had doubled over the last 10 years and REITs were already outperforming and then went on to even outperform even more. Uh, finally, before we start talking about property types in the next slide, slide here, uh, we think it's really important why investors need to understand REITs uh, because uh, they're already a large asset class, 1.3 trillion uh, market cap of publicly traded equity REITs. Uh, however, there's a lot of non-traded, uh, non-REIT property out there, which we think will increasingly become under REIT ownership. Um, especially as transaction costs get lower, as markets become more efficient. Um, already, real estate has become its own GICS sector in the S&P 500. So they used to be under financials. Now they have their own major sector. There's a few other real estate services in there, but that's mostly REITs. Turning now to REIT property types, before I hand it over to talk specifics, uh, it's good to get an overview. Uh, so this next slide here, page 10, you can see um, the top 10 REITs, the largest REITs by market cap. This has been increasingly dominated by infrastructure and data center REITs, which Keith will talk about, but you still have a, a retail in there, residential, even a self-storage, healthcare. And then the pie chart on the left, you can see one property type doesn't dominate. Uh, real estate is an asset class, but within real estate, you're actually spanning all kinds of different industries and they all have different nuances, which we'll get into. This next slide here is, is really important. I, I like this slide and I'm amazed by it every time I update it. Uh, you can see this is just uh, total return performance over the last year for REIT property types. Uh, so this is not specific companies, but actually broad types. Uh, they all start at zero and then they fan out. And this is not just a product of COVID-19. Uh, when I've looked at this chart before, this has been the same case every year. You have REITs on the top, like industrial right now, and then you have underperforming REITs down 50%, 40%, like hotel and retail. Uh, so the spread between there is always 50 to 60% we've seen. And the reason this is so important is because this creates a huge opportunity for alpha. You know, if investors just uh, properly or, or, or put the odds on their side by correctly assessing the fundamentals in the REIT property type to begin with, um, you have the opportunity for a very high return or very high outperformance in regards to just looking at the entire REIT as a homogenous group. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ken now, who's going to go into the specifics on office REITs. Thanks, Chris. And also bridging to that interesting slide on the wide spread of performance, we're really in a stock pickers market where it's not only a question of picking the right property type, uh, but all boats don't rise together. And from my presentation, Chris and Keith, you'll see that there's different portfolios, different strategies, even within the property type. So I would make the case not to invest passively in ETFs, but look for active good selections uh, into, the, into the property and REITs we recommend. So here we go. This is a snapshot of office REITs. Um, you can see that they have significantly underperformed the S&P 500, uh, especially uh, since the beginning of COVID-19. Uh, this is a classic cyclical sensitive property type, one that certainly is driven just by watching uh, uh, jobs and job growth. Uh, the companies featured on the left um, do have variations, which we'll get into. Uh, the largest one, Alexander Real Estate, is an exciting life science play. Uh, and then you have the traditional uh, urban coastal market REITs such as Boston Properties, Vernado, uh, Kilroy, they're out in California, Douglas Emmett, and then some Sunbelt. Um, SL Green is the largest real estate player in Manhattan. Next. So, COVID-19 is front and center for all of real estate, but certainly for, for office. And the, the big issue really relates to uh, what will be the road to recovery? What, will it be V-shaped? We think more U or L-shaped. Uh, the big question really relates to what will be the new normal 
and how quickly will workers get back into the office, which is a big part of media today. 72% decline, 72% decline in real estate investment when you look at the end of the second quarter was 10.9 billion, a year ago was about $39 billion. So there's been a significant uh, pullback in making new investments in office real estate. Uh, additionally, the, the shock from COVID-19 has also created some concerns uh, as it relates to uh, new developments. Uh, certainly the ones that are, have a high pre-leased ratio will get completed. But when you look below the total US market, New York, which is about 25% of new real estate investment, was down 34%. Greater Los Angeles down 14, San Francisco down 16%, Dallas down 8%. Um, the one bright spot, and I, I love this illustration because across all of our property types, location, 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 uh, this is Alexandria uh, Real Estate. Uh, it's a snapshot in blue highlighting their life science buildings. It is a major campus in the global largest market for life science in Cambridge, Massachusetts. They built this over 30 years. They got 100% occupancy, uh, very little in terms of risk to vacancy or collections. Next. So in terms of the office market seeing choppy waters, low visibilities, questions whether it's a U or L shape, not for the next quarter or so, but out through possibly the end of 2021. What we're watching um, is occupancy and absorption of uh, available space. Occupancies have come down to 300 basis points. Uh, they were for the best urban markets, um, well over 90%. Um, a component of occupancy is not only office space, uh, but you're looking at about roughly five to 10% of your rental revenue coming from retail tenants. Uh, those collections have come down significantly. Uh, March, April, 50%, they're up to 70%. Office is above 90. Uh, these are leases seven to nine years. You know, we think that uh, the challenge is filling space. Uh, the, the picture, I love this picture. This is SL Green. They cut the ribbon last week, opening up one Vanderbilt. This is as tall as the Empire State Building, 72% uh, pre-lease. It was over 80% uh, before COVID, but they got large floor plates, very attractive uh, windows, floor to ceilings, and they got to reconfigure space for COVID. On the right, you know, so urban markets like New York, San Francisco, Washington, D.C., it was the whole lifestyle of live, work, and play in urban markets. And we've seen an exit of uh, families and workers from the cities to sometimes moving in with their parents uh, outside of the city. Uh, but it's a, it's a big shakeup. Uh, the question is whether we get back to how exciting urban markets were. Suburban offices have picked up. Uh, that picture on the right, for those of you not from New York, is the James Farley Postal Station. It was acquired by Vernado, backed by the state of New York. It's also part of the new Amtrak um, Long Island Railroad Station, um, over a million square feet. And there are some leading companies still signing leases. For Vernado, this is part of their major Penn District redevelopment uh, that is adjacent to Hudson Yards. Facebook last week signed 730,000 square feet, realizing that New York is a magnet for talent, just as San Francisco and other players like Amazon, Alphabet, and also, and, uh, Microsoft are adding in Manhattan. Next. So this is the rhythm of the numbers. Um, you know, the question is, as we, we move this out to 2021, especially what does real estate investment growth or FFO growth will look like? They're likely to be in the rack. We're gonna see a pause in real estate uh, besides REITs. And as Chris mentioned, uh, it's a small part of the overall commercial market so whether you're talking insurance companies, pensions, or sovereign funds, move, looking at the U.S., they're beginning to smell opportunity because of value. 
uh, but we're not there yet. So, you know, activity might be a bit quiet well into 2021. Uh, the big question now, and I spoke to a colleague in London, is the risk of a second rise of, of the coronavirus. And London, they're, they're actually locking down even more for shelter in place. We hope that's not the case in major cities in the US. This is gonna create a lag. Next. So our recommendations are selective, as I mentioned at the top. Uh, Alexandria Real Estate is by far our, my best recommendation. We're talking organic, 15, 70% revenue growth. Uh, they have a best of breed franchise. They're not only in Cambridge, as I showed in the picture, they're in the Bay Area, uh, the Somo area of San Francisco, uh, San Diego, and expanding in New York. Uh, it's a terrific company. As you'll hear later in my healthcare presentation, they're all trying to chase them in this category of life science office. Now, Brandywine, ticker is BDN, it's a buy. Uh, they're in, and I don't think anyone knows this, but the fastest growing and increasingly going to be the fourth largest market for life science is Philadelphia, situated near Penn Station and the University of Pennsylvania and Drexel University is a phenomenal campus there that Brandywine is developing. Uh, they're also expanding in Austin, Texas, as we all know, a great mecca for technology and services company. So we have, we have cells, as I should talked about Manhattan on SL Green and Vernado. There are two very different approaches. SL Green tries to either new Greenfield builds like one Vanderbilt uh, they do have something down in the Flatiron District where they're taking a great property at One Madison, uh, a stone building, let's call it 12, 15 floors, putting on top of it another 30, 35 floors glass building uh, around Madison Park. Um, but lots of issues with SL Green. It looks really cheap. I, I just don't see a lot of visibility right now in terms of what they're doing in Manhattan. They're trying to sell off some joint venture investments. Bernardo um, is the Penn District redevelopment. Um, great company in terms of selling off retail. Uh, they have some other properties in San Francisco and in, uh, in Chicago with the Mart. Um, but again, uh, to say you're gonna bump up rents redeveloping from 60 to 70 up to $100 like Hudson Yards, it's gonna take some time. Let's move on to the next property type. Residential REITs. So looking at resi residential REITs, next please. Um, here again, um, many of the leaders, you know, these portfolios of Avalon Bay, Equity Residential, Essex Property, uh, those three are coastal markets. They're in Boston, New York, Washington, DC, also Seattle and California. Um, and we've seen probably the biggest downturn uh, in the residential properties for those geographies. The more stable areas have been Sunbelt or what I'll, we'll get to class B buildings, which are older and a little bit more stable or specialized. Uh, invitation homes is a play on uh, single family rental homes. Sun communities is a play on the leisure retirement uh, for manufactured homes and RVs. We'll talk more about that. So is equity lifestyles. Next. So looking at the impact from COVID-19, um, it has also been staggering in terms of the pandemic, uh, disrupting leasing monthly rental collections. I'll give you an anecdote. This came from the CEO of Camden Property Trust. They're based in Texas. Uh, and it varies by culture or by state. Uh, in Houston, which is a distressed market, the delinquency rate for Camden is uh, 0.016. In their California markets, where they have a lot of properties in greater LA and Orange County, the delinquency is 7.25%. Uh, interesting, not gonna pass any political comments there, uh, but collections are important or the word forbearance. So if I'm in an apartment, I lost my job, I might have two or three months, I don't have to pay rent. Hopefully I'm getting federal subsidies, but that stretches out the cash flow 
and the leases for residential REITs. Um, rental rate declines, two categories. New rates, we are definitely seeing um, a three, five percent reduction in, in these lease rates uh, for renewals in some case. And by the way, they're getting one or two, three months, especially if they're in urban markets like New York or San Francisco. On the renewals, um, they're doing okay, um, but you can't raise rents. So th this creates a, a tough picture for FFO growth. And flight to single family homes, I cover the housing ecosystem. Uh, housing is on fire and they're coming out of Manhattan or San Francisco or elsewhere. Next. So when we look at the residential REITs in terms of types, high rise towers, coastal markets, uh, really underperforming, these are class A properties. Uh, normally uh, we see strong leasing activity through the, the second quarter and the vacancy rates rose 60 basis points to 4.6% a year. The vacancies are actually even higher, 75 basis points change up to 5.7% in these class A high rise towers. Class B is a little more stable. We only saw vacancies up 20 basis points to 4%. Uh, so again, uh, we are seeing, I think as an investor, the need to move away from these largest cap residential REITs, which are mostly uh, the class A properties and look to class B, uh, names like MAA, which we'll get into in the Sun Belt. Uh, additionally, Student housing, I don't have a slide just on student housing, but uh, universities have students back to school, either uh, distance learning from their uh, off-campus housing, which American campus community uh, is the dominant player. We have a strong sell there. Uh, Goldman actually had it on their conviction list of what businesses could come back in two or three years, uh, which could be ticker ACC, but uh, we think it's got a ways to go. Slide 22, please. Again, here's the data set for residential REITs, not as acute of what we just saw in office REITs. Again, you got to hone in on what this picture looks like in 2021 for real estate investment growth and FF growth. So at CFRA, and, and Chris was one of the primary authors of our expectation investing, at some point things will go from bad to good where expectations will be so low, there will be an opportunity. And it's going to be, I think, when there's a realization for office and residential that there isn't new supply coming to the market. So eventually as the markets recover, they're gonna have a, a pricing power to raise rents. Not today though. Um, and of course, the big concern I still see here is the risk of a second rise and whether, uh, whether it's the millennial generation or my kids, whether they're gonna go back and re-sign their leases in Manhattan and elsewhere. So it's an interesting category, but I don't think it's gonna be one of the more attractive areas. Next. Selectivity, again, quickly, Mid-America apartment communities. Uh, we like it, it is conservative, suburban uh, properties and Sunbelt markets, uh, really a stable REIT, which we like. Uh, those specialized REITs in uh, leisure RV rental communities, uh, very stable, mostly retired, so we don't have to worry about unemployment, is equity lifestyle <clears throat> properties and sun communications. <clears throat> Names that we like, but the prices have moved so much since March is Invitation Home and American Homes for Rent. Uh, these uh, are well above their March lows, up 70, 80 percent. Uh, we're looking for opportunity, but we do like the fundamentals, and Avalon fits that class A property with a cell. Let's move on to healthcare REITs. And here uh, we think it's a complex, complex, it's a very fascinating area, uh, but we would turn the traditional view of investing here upside down, which would be essentially go with the largest healthcare REITs. They got a high percentage of senior housing. Uh, we think we would want to avoid a well tower, a Ventas, or Health Peak. All three, the big three, have a meaningful part of senior housing, and they do have medical office and life science, but we have other names like Medical Property Trust, Pure Play, 
in terms of actually global acute care hospitals. Uh, they have a $3 billion pipeline uh, in US, Europe, and Australia, and they execute well. Uh, Healthcare Trust of America, we'll get to later. They're a great play on medical offices. Uh, this has been one of the worst performing categories. Uh, again, uh, the fundamentals are likely to be uh, l shape to probably the second half of 2021, uh, certainly for senior housing. Next. So when we look at um, healthcare REITs, uh, this was a stable, predictable property type, and COVID-19 has changed the entire game. Um, the areas, though, that have been resistant or, or favorable have been life science, medical office. The areas that have been under enormous strain is senior housing. Senior housing has been depressed. Essentially, you could not bring in prospects or visitors uh, when COVID started in March. Just now, uh, they're opening up for uh, any interested prospective residents, but the uh, guidelines for which are state government driven are very rigid in terms of uh, visiting with elderly residents to protect their health. In a normal year, flu would be dangerous, but we've all read um, not only nursing homes, which is not REITs, but um, senior citizen housing. It's tough. And, and those categories could be uh, campuses with independent living, uh, assisted living, for those who need personal care services, memory care, and also uh, those who are in uh, putting equity in for continuing care. So it's a fascinating area, but you gotta be selective. Next slide, please. So our strategy is really to stay with life science and medical office campuses. Uh, we would avo avoid yet uh, senior housing, although I am watching, just like Chris is watching, uh, retail shopping malls and centers for that inflection point where we think the fundamentals are gonna turn and we wanna get them before the stocks move. Um, it's a complex area, but we think um, given the status of COVID-19, uh, you have to be very selective. The long-term, the bull case here is demographics are very positive, the aging US population, and also REITs, those who pick healthcare operators uh, who are good at running properties are going to outperform. Those who pick names like Manor Care or Brookdale have underperformed. Next. Uh, again, looking at the data, but this one you can see in the, in the second quarter of 2020, uh, real estate is down, FFL growth because of uh, vacancies and also RevPoor, which is uh, the revenue per occupied room is coming down that FFO growth that all analysts watch down 14%. I think we're gonna see red all the way into the second quarter of next year. Uh, COVID-19 is the major disruption. And when we look at investing in senior housing, uh, it's going to be uh, basically quiet uh, for the next year or two. Recommendations before I turn it over to Chris, next. So we like Pure Play Medical Office Operator, Healthcare Trust of America. Uh, what I love about this is just not uh, office buildings, but these are thoughtful campuses adjacent to healthcare systems or universities. That's 60% of their annual rental rent. They fill it out with 13% of national or regional providers. Uh, their risk on collections was that small medical practices. Medical Properties Trust, uh, they're the uh, global acquirer of acute care hospitals, three billion pi pipeline, as I've mentioned. And surprisingly, you would think for acute care hospitals, collections or rents would be a problem. It's 98%, great backlog. Uh, well Tower and Ventos, we've already laid out our view on senior housing. So we would avoid or sell Ventos. And with that, let me turn it over to Chris. Thank you, Ken. All right, so diving into industrial REITs now, uh, the first thing you'll notice on our snapshot here is uh, it is dominated in terms of the publicly traded companies uh, by Prologis. Prologis continues to gobble up its competitors, both publicly traded and private companies. Uh, and then you'll also see the massive outperformance of the group, not only to the other 
uh, broad U.S. REIT equity index, but also the S&P 500 itself. Uh, and just to, to make sure we're all on the same page, when we're talking about industrial REITs, uh, we're not talking about manufacturing or assembly line or factories or stuff like that. Uh, industrial in this sense is particularly uh, pertaining to warehouses and logistics centers. So these are like the big football field size buildings that you see with all the truck bays. Uh, they're taking in inventory and then uh, sending it back out through their logistics centers. The next slide here, 32, you see a snapshot of the fundamentals. Uh, the two things we're highlighting here in graphical format is the robust growth in real estate investment growth and then the FFO growth. Uh, some of the highest FFO growth in uh, all of the REITs. And then they've been, uh, because they've been doing so well, their balance sheets have been pristine. They started out strong and they continue to get stronger. Uh, I mentioned Prologis before making all these acquisitions. Uh, they've been using their stock as a currency, doing all equity deals rather than taking on more debt, which we think is uh, the exact right thing to do. And it's been really helpful for them to be able to do that. So turning now to why the big outperformance, why is there this massive five-year or more outperformance in industrial REITs? And we like to point to two 3x factors or three times factors. So the first one is e-commerce is growing three times as fast as total retail sales. So 15% versus 5%. Um, and remember, uh, industrial REITs are logistics centers. So e-commerce, shipping stuff online to customers, that's what's driving that demand for that warehouse space. Uh, and then the second thing is uh, e-commerce actually requires three times the amount of warehouse and logistics space as compared to your traditional brick and mortar retail. And so the reason for this is if you think of a big box retail store like a Best Buy or a Bed Bath & Beyond, uh, you know, they have a lot of space in that store to house the warehouse and uh, accept returns. As you move this online, uh, you have to take more and more of those jobs on within the warehouse itself. Also, when people shop online, they expect more selection, so a higher number of SKUs. Uh, you have higher inventory turns, and then processing those returns in the warehouse rather than your retail stores uh, can be significant. For apparel retailers, returns can be as high as 30% of sales. So now industrial REITs in COVID-19, what's the impact? Uh, you know, when COVID hit, we were actually a little concerned about being long and so positive on industrial REITs. We have a positive sub industry outlook. We've had it for years. COVID hit. And one of the things we know about industrial REITs is that they're highly correlated to consumer spending. Uh, these warehouses don't move business to business goods. They don't move, you know, parts or raw material or machinery. Um, they're not moving through commodities like grain or, or stuff like that. They're primarily moving consumer goods. Their largest tenants are Amazon, um, re online retailers like Wayfair, very consumer facing. So as consumer spending pulled back due to COVID and the unfolding recession, we thought, how are industrial REITs going to fare? On the other side of this, though, what was also happening was the massive increase in e-commerce because of the lockdowns and because of uh, all the restrictions around regular retail brick and mortar shopping. So, so there you see the huge spike. Obviously, you know, that's going to come down a little bit because some of that's temporary. Uh, but really, it's taken our entire thesis, this multi-year thesis of e-commerce continuing to penetrate uh, regular retail sales. Uh, we said this is going to happen for years and years and years. We probably took two or three years of growth uh, or penetration and compressed that into two quarters. Uh, it's been absolutely astounding. Going back to our expectation framework, you know, a lot of people are saying these stocks look expensive. Why, why are you still so bullish on them? And although they, they look expensive, they have high expectations priced into them, we still think those expectations are too low. These are your classic growth stock stories where uh, people – no expectations are high, but these companies continue to exceed them. And we still think investors are underappreciating the magnitude of this secular growth driver. Uh, so with that slide 35, you see our recommendations. We are long the whole group, uh, buys on everything with the exception of Prologis, which gets the strong buy because it's best of breed. It's got the largest economies of scale and by far the best balance sheet. Their management team has also proven to be very good capital allocators. Uh, they have lost big deals, which I actually like um, counterintuitively because it says to me that they're, they are still being 
uh, rational about pricing. Uh, even they know everything has a price and a maximum that they can go up to. Uh, so that's why the Prologis gets the strong buy. Moving on to 36 here, uh, retail REITs, the other end of the spectrum. Uh, here, if you look at our snapshot, you don't have as big of dominating companies. You actually used to have Simon at the top. They've been slipping now, the largest uh, shopping mall operator. Uh, but you have a much more diversified uh, group here. And then on the total return, you see the massive underperformance. So not only has the group as a whole underperformed, but you can also split out the group between the enclosed malls and the retail shopping centers or the strip centers. And you can see the enclosed malls have really been the ones dragging them down uh, over the past few years. Next slide, you can see the snapshot of the fundamentals again. Uh, here, the big takeaway when looking at the graph as well, you know, that blue line FFO growth, FFO growth was decelerating in 2016, 2017, 2018, barely putting up any growth. And then 2019 already, it was a negative 7%. Uh, and then of course, coronavirus has just driven that uh, even further into negative territory. So my point here is uh, retail as a sector was already struggling before coronavirus. It, it was not just this uh, exogenous shock that came out of nowhere. Um, the US is very over retailed compared to other countries. And we also think it's not just the Amazon effect, but um, people are just, you know, kind of getting tired of the current retail format. And I'll talk a little bit about that with malls more. Uh, within retail though, I wouldn't call them bright stars, but you do have what I'd say are more resilient property types. Uh, the shopping centers that have undergone the fallout, they've, they've repositioned themselves, especially those with grocery anchors or necessity shopping, they're going to do a lot better. Grocery uh, e-commerce is still very low single digit percentage in terms of penetration, maybe four or 5%. You know, we think that's going to come up, but it's going to take a long time. Uh, and then you have your freestanding or what is also known as your triple net lease property types. Uh, so these are single tenant uh, freestanding buildings by themselves. They're not a strip center. So think of like uh, a, a freestanding Walgreens or a CVS or a gas station. They tend to be more necessity based, more service oriented. They have national uh, higher credit rated tenants in them. We think they're going to do better as well. Although I would note you have to be a little bit careful because some of these still have a good chunk of their portfolio in things like movie theaters or fitness centers, which are going to be the slowest to recover coming out of this. I mentioned malls, looking at them uh, more deeply here, they've gone from bad to worse to absolutely catastrophic. Uh, we actually were negative when I started covering malls in 2017. I said, these low class B and C malls, the lower productive malls, they're gonna be in trouble. The high class, you know, will probably do okay. They have better balance sheets. Uh, by 2018, we realized that the, uh, the high class malls were not immune to this disease either. Uh, store closures were accelerating. So we went negative on the higher class, class A malls as well, your Simons, your Mesa Riches, those types of malls. Uh, this, this store closure information comes from CoreSight research that's been tracking uh, retail store closures for a number of years now. Um, clearly 2020, we're on pace to exceed 2019's net closure rate. Uh, earlier in the year, they put out a big number of possibly 25,000 store closures in 2020. I don't think we're going to hit that uh, just because we're already far into the year and most stores are going to try to stay open through the holiday season. Uh, nevertheless, we continue to see accelerations into 2021. Uh, and then a lot of these malls still have very significant exposure to the troubled anchor stores. Um, you know, a lot of the malls, this was their traffic generator. And now this anchor has literally become an anchor around their neck. It's a big, big piece of, uh, of, of, of real estate that they have to subdivide. They have to put in a lot of capital to either uh, divide it up or turn it into something else, find new tenants. Uh, and that's increasingly becoming difficult. And as they were doing all these renovations, their legs have gotten cut out from under them with COVID. So what's the result? You see on the right, um, their leverage has absolutely skyrocketed and it's put these malls in a very precarious position. CBL at the top there, uh, they're expected to file for bankruptcy. So they're the first domino to fall. And we wouldn't be surprised to see uh, some other big major debt restructurings as well. So wrapping up with, with retail REITs, obviously um, very bearish on the enclosed shopping malls and outlet stores. 
I would note Simon was a bit of a non-consensus call when we went negative uh, a while back. Uh, that's because Simon has only outlet stores and these stores are way outside of the city center. So you can't take this land in a metropolitan area like some of the other malls and turn them into offices or residential areas. Uh, so we don't see a, a lot of options left for something like a Tanger. Uh, and then on the, the other end of the spectrum, uh, we are more positive on those resilient types, the triple net freestanding and the biggest ones there, national retail properties and Realty Income Corporation. So on that somewhat depressing note, we'll turn to uh, a little more positive retail property type with data centers over to Keith. Great, thank you. Um, so yeah, so data center REITs have, uh, they've been a bright spot, um, not really, not only this year, but really for the past few years. Um, and, you know, this uh, performance that we're seeing is, you know, it's not anything that has cropped up recently, but it's rather a continuation of a number of trends. Um, that have been persistent for at least the last few years, and we continue uh, will continue to be persistent uh, moving forward. Um, so next slide. So really what we're seeing in this market is a lot of data traffic growth um, and then enterprises moving over to cloud and software as a service. Um, we also have a lot of new internet connections so especially in developing markets um, you know that 5.3 billion internet users will be up from 3.9 in 2018 uh, but the growth is also coming from not only the number of users but the number of connected devices per capita is expected to jump to 3.6 from 2.4 so we have both the number of people getting online increasing as well as the number of connected devices um, so that traffic is really forcing these companies to invest in their infrastructure. Um, you know, you have two types of companies, those that can keep up with the tech trends um, and those that go out of business. So it's really not um, a matter of, you know, a matter of choice for these companies uh, to invest in this. And then we see a lot of that movement to the cloud. You see the hyperscale cloud providers um, pushing really hard to get new space, uh, especially in international markets. Uh, just as demand for their services grows. So on the next slide, um, in terms of COVID, there really hasn't been much of an impact. Uh, we've seen work from home has certainly boosted demand for, uh, for internet services. Um, so that's 60% growth was kind of a peak level. It seems to have more stabilized in the uh, like 30% range. So it's about internet traffic's roughly 30% higher than pre-COVID levels. Um, the good thing is that now traffic is much more spread out throughout the day, so we're not seeing spikes like we used to. Um, it's just kind of a steady level of traffic, um, and that's being generated by, you know, a lot of uh, people are adopting video communication services, um, Zoom, WebEx, Microsoft Teams. All of those services tend to be fairly data intensive, um, and, you know, it, it's a, this is no longer, this is an essential service for people. Um, without an internet connection, really, you can't work from home at all. And so what we're seeing is in a lot of the top markets, demand for space, so Northern Virginia, Silicon Valley, um, Dallas, Chicago, demand is continuing to outstrip supply, um, even though supply is coming online very, very quickly. Um, and that's kind of more or less been the one area that we've seen a few hiccups from COVID, and that's just construction. Uh, some areas have shut down construction completely, but there are a number of markets that have deemed this construction essential services, so they've been able to continue uh, moving along. But there's some markets like uh, Europe, especially where um, in these areas that have been really hard hit, it's hard to find crews to actually build these projects. And that's one of the biggest challenges they're having is just getting enough people on site to, uh, to get these construction projects done. In terms of customer base, typically, they're very diversified. Um, companies are reporting a very small number of requests for financial relief, and that the number of requests has been decelerating over the past few months. So I think we've seen the spike. The worst is more or less over for these guys, um, and you know, the financial impact was minimal. Moving on to the next slide, um, with this high growth, this stable growth, uh, it's demanded a very high valuation. So these companies typically trade at multiples well above the s p uh, and that's just because the growth is there the dividend yield is there 
Um, and that dividend yield is extremely well supported by cash flow. There's most of the major players have zero cash flow issues. Their balance sheets are very strong. Um, the credit markets are very receptive to new debt raises from these guys, um, and they're getting really attractive rates. Uh, you know, making the return on investment for new construction quite good for these companies. And we see no reason for that to change. Um, you know, it's it's kind of the best of both worlds in this case. Um, so some of the names we like on the next slide, Equinix is definitely our, one of our top choices. They're the biggest, um, and in this industry, size is a huge competitive advantage, especially for Equinix where they have a very, very strong international presence. Um, and that's becoming increasingly, uh, increasingly important to customers, both due to um, just growth overseas, but um, also data protection or data privacy laws, especially in Europe, um, that are forcing the companies to house their servers in Europe. Um, they're not allowed to base, they're not allowed to store the data offshore. And so that's forcing a lot of new uh, investment in that area. Um, and so we just like Equinix, that's why they have a buy opinion. Um, they recently received a um, an investment grade rating from Moody's, which has lowered their cost of capital quite significantly. And they're taking advantage of that, um, refinancing a ton of debt. Um, and really being active in the debt markets right now. Digital Realty, next largest. Um, they're pushing hard into international markets, especially um, Brazil and, um, and Europe. They've been doing that through acquisitions mostly. Uh, and, you know, it's, uh, their big benefit here is they have a really high occupancy rate. And so high occupancy rate and stable customer, uh, or sorry, diversified customer base. Um, Sirius One, very high growth rate. The problem is they have invested over 100% of revenues for the past like, three or four years, expanding their uh, their footprint. And so that, you know, to us, that's not a sustainable investment profile. Um, and then on top of that, this growth has been fueled by hyperscale customers. So these are the customers that will come in and rent out 90% of a data center. Um, this is great for them right now. The problem is that we, f we think there's a risk of these customers turning around and deciding to build their own data centers. And the loss of a single customer is a huge hit for these guys. Um, Coresight is, is another name, uh, a smaller player in the space. Um, they're focused on North America mostly, and they're in basically every single one of the top markets in the US. Um, they also have a very, their buildings tend to be extremely interconnected. So they have a lot of customers in a single building which uh, actually they've been able to command above market rates just because that's a very hard thing to replicate. And so they actually own probably arguably one of the most valuable data centers in the world on the West Coast that just has so many customers in it. The demand is so high for interconnections um, that they're able to charge you know, a ton of money for space there. Um, finally, QTS, um, our other buy in this space, a small player and great North American exposure. Um, a very deep land base, um, and they're starting to expand into international markets. They were able to pick up two Netherlands data centers for basically a song. Um, and we honestly think that this could be a takeout target. There's a lot of private equity firms, um, sovereign funds, just a lot of money is trying to get into this space right now. And QTS represents a turnkey entrance into this market for, you know, a few billion dollars, which for big private equity funds is not out of the question. Moving on now to wireless tower REITs. Um, so this market is dominated by just three big players. Um, you know, they've amassed a huge position. This is kind of the perfect business to be in. Uh, the cell phone companies actually don't want to own the towers themselves. They've been selling off their positions, you know, the last five, six years. And there's, there's an opportunity for very high returns on investment, especially as you build up multiple tenants on each site. So with that, you know, they have performed better than the S&P year to date. And a lot like data centers, this is a continuation of trends we've seen for the last four years. Moving to the next slide, uh, you know, we're seeing a huge jump in mobile traffic, um, especially as connection speeds get faster. We see a big shift in international markets. Um, you know, India is pushing really hard to get mobile networks deployed. Uh, Brazil, um, Africa, all these markets are really hot right now. And so we're expecting to see a doubling of the number of towers 
um, over the next 10 years. And a lot of that is coming from the small cell side, which I'll get into in a bit, but that's gonna be really important for 5G. Uh, and so, you know, with the towers, um, oh, sorry, the other thing that's going on is, especially in the US is spectrum auctions. So spectrum auctions are great for these tower companies uh, because as the spectrum gets bought up, it requires new equipment to be placed on towers. And that typically means lease modifications, which is kind of uh, very high margin revenue for them. And so we're seeing actually that jump quite a bit. Moving on to the next slide. In terms of COVID, just like uh, data centers, the impact has been very minimal. Um, the customer base for these guys, Sprint, AT&T, T-Mobile, or T-Mobile Sprint now, uh, huge companies, financially secure. They're not gonna you know, default anytime soon. Uh, and the build out plans have remained on track. CapEx budgets remain where they are. And you know, these were long-term plans and they've just simply continued their build out. There's you know, the 5G race going on right now has not slowed at all. Um, and then on top of that, we have Dish who now is entering the market. Um, they're required to build out a network covering 70% of the population by 2023 while T-Mobile needs to build out a 5G network covering 97% of the population within three years. So these are pretty tight timelines um, and it just requires a ton of money and investment um, and towers are the first thing that they need to build out. The one thing we're seeing is small delays with the small cell permits. Um, and this is just due to municipalities essentially operating at skeleton crew levels, um, if not completely shutting down. And so the permitting process, which was already pretty slow, um, has more or less ground to a halt. But in this bottleneck will pass um, and you know they'll start being able to deploy these uh, cells again. Next slide. Uh, you know, with the stable growth comes a high uh, high valuations as well. So uh, the only difference here is that we think the dividend yield is really not as attractive as other players, uh, you know, other REIT, uh, other REITs. So the the high yield is a little bit harder to swallow for us. Um, and with that, on the next slide, you know, that's more or less the reason why we're hold across the space. Um, there's not going to we're not going to see a spike in growth from you know COVID or any one incident, just given how long term deployments are. Uh, companies are not all of a sudden going to pour money into the market. They have very well-defined plans and they will follow them to the letter. These typically last three or four years um, and these cycles are few and far between. So, you know, the growth is there, but it's very smooth and there's very little chance of very sudden outperformance in the space. And so American Tower, definitely the biggest, um, huge international presence. They're really focused on Africa right now. Um, with expansion efforts and like data centers, size matters. You want, you know, a one-stop shop um, for towers. Crown Castle, smaller player, much more focused on small cells. That's actually really kind of the bread and butter of what they're doing now, but they're also buying up the fiber assets in urban areas. And so what they're able to offer is a one-stop shop again, where they can provide the, the small cell access as well as the fiber connection for data backhaul, which is a very cha it's a challenging area for companies to backhaul the data into their network core. And so that's a very attractive proposition. SBA, um, again, is extremely focused on international expansion and um, has been investing very, very heavily in this space. And so with that, I'm gonna turn the call back over to Ken for Q and A. Thanks, Keith. And looking at questions coming in, the first one is for you, Chris. Uh, Simon Property, um, it, you know, it's buying its own tenants out of bankruptcy. J.C. Penney, Brooks, Forever Twenty One, Lucky. Um, is, is this a good, just a sinking ship? What, what, what do you think about Simon Property here? Yeah, it's an interesting strategy. I, I get the. I get the reasoning behind it that if they can, you know, help some of their tenants out, they think there's a good brand there. Uh, it can be a win-win, uh, but I think it's a really dangerous uh, gambit. I mean, other people have pointed to Aeropostale, which they did during the last crisis, and it turned out to be okay. Uh, they got through it. I don't, I don't know. You know, they may have made an accounting profit, but the question is, uh, what could they have done with that money instead if they could have had a better return, uh, sticking to their knitting? 
the the big problem I see with this is that they're doing bigger acquisitions of bigger brands, and kind of underlying this is the assumption that you can bring a brand back to life. And if anyone on the call can give me a counterexample, because I have tried and I cannot find one or think of one of where a brand, especially a clothing brand, which tends, you know, consumers tend to be very fickle with them, uh, that's kind of gone by the wayside, gone out of favor, left for dead, and then somehow makes a comeback. I, I just haven't seen it before. So I'm very skeptical that this can happen again. So this question came in, are, are there any actively managed REITs that don't specialize in a particular property type? Uh, what is their performance? So what about global versus US? I'll take the second one first. Uh, most REITs are US centric focus uh, from today's presentation um, in Keith's area, uh, wireless tower and data centers like Equinox uh, are global, uh, healthcare, medical property trusts, MPW, and in industrial REITs or e-commerce, Prologis, PLD. Uh, Brook, other ways to play global, of course, is outside of REITs. Uh, there's a whole variant of Brookfield asset management properties. They are global, um, and or you have to move outside the REIT realm to private equity like Blackstone or KKR. Um, Chris, I'll let you help share this question. Uh, REITs that don't specialize in a particular type, well, first of all, on property types, um, what Keith was covering today were in the GIC sector, specialized REITs. What you might be thinking here is diversified REITs. And what I saw three or five years ago, those that had, let's say, office and an industrial paired off their offices so they could take the secular uh, trend in e-commerce. Chris, any thoughts here on really diversified and you know, from my thinking, uh, usually performances, they've underperformed because they weren't pure plays in a suitable property type. But what do you think? Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. It's kind of a double-edged sword to you. Uh, if you can transition your property to a pure play, you can get that higher multiple. You can get more credit if you're in the right industry. But of course, if uh, it turns out to be the wrong industry, it goes the other way. One company I cover, Service Properties, SVC, they actually changed their name and ticker uh, because they were uh, primarily hotel. Uh, they also owned the Travel Center of America, the gas and truck stops. They started selling a lot of the truck stops and then they bought this huge uh, you know, net lease retail portfolio. So the, the more gas stations, the strip centers, the, the retail properties, um, you know, thinking they wanted to diversify out of pure hotels because hotel is one of the most cyclical industries. Unfortunately, they diversified into probably the second worst uh, property type, which is retail. Uh, so they've been hurting because of that. Uh, they, you know, it was a huge acquisition under their balance sheet and it hasn't uh, really produced uh, or been accretive to any of their metrics. And it's looked like it's going to be a problem for them. Uh, so Keith, we love the data center market. It's, it's exciting and growing, but let's play politics. Um, has climate change uh, impacted uh, their business? And many of these are in California. So have they started any fires out there? Uh, do we have a risk here with data center REITs? So yes, so there's actually a huge risk from climate change right now. Um, and a lot of companies are now starting to plan for that when they choose locations. Um, you know, California, as you said, earth, earthquake prone, um, power is often inconsistent due to fires, um, you know, blackouts. That's not something that data centers like. And um, so also access to renewable power is becoming an increasingly big deal in the space. Um, getting the, you know, the lead environmental certification for data centers actually does um, boost its appeal to a lot of customers. Um, the large, you know, Facebooks, the Googles, they're all making pledges for, um, you know, carbon neutral and all that. Um, and so you see in markets, especially like uh, Houston, Dallas, um, these markets have a ton of access to affordable, renewable power. And that's actually part of the reason why a lot of you know, companies are flocking out there. And so we're seeing um, redundancy is a big thing. So not putting all of your eggs in one basket and really spreading your tech out throughout the country, if not the world, just to avoid any catastrophe in one single area. Um, and so, you know, that's top of mind right now for data center operators and the customers. Uh, so Chris, um, 
this question really relates to real estate investment growth for industrial REITs. Is it, you know, one risk you always have for any property type is oversupply and overtaking demand. Um, and you know, with e-commerce, industrial REITs by far is, has been uh, the best category. So what do you think is the dynamics now? Because we're all home, we're all ordering Amazon and it's coming from facilitation centers uh, that I see in central Jersey, they're in the Inland Empire of California. Uh, when does the music stop? Yeah, it's always something that people have watched closely for industrial REITs. You know, when does supply catch up? And years ago, that that was the name of the game. You know, keep your eye on supply because these things were cheap to build. You built them outside of the city where land was, was plentiful. Uh, they're easy to slap up. And so supply could quickly uh, dwarf demand and then your rental rates plunge. However, e-commerce, besides driving the demand, they've actually completely upended the entire supply equation as well. No longer do you want uh, your logistics center way outside the city to store your product cheap. You want it in the city so you can get it to your customer in two days or less. I mean, Amazon was the big driver. Now everyone like Wayfair and everyone else has to meet these table stakes of, of faster and faster shipping times. Uh, with more of the population living in urban areas, You've got uh, your customer base there. So they have to put them in there and land is very constrained in these, these metropolitan areas. It's constrained because they're dense. Uh, they have really big zoning regulations. Um, there's you know permitting they need to get because of the traffic or the noise levels. Uh, so all these factors have really kept a lid on supply. Now that's not to say it's not gonna matter eventually. I mean, we've already seen rental rates going up 30% a year down to, you know, 10, 15% a year, maybe even a little less. So it is catching up. It's something we're gonna keep an eye on, uh, but the demand continues to outstrip it. Uh, three quick questions to me on healthcare, and I'll do them fast. Um, Alexander Real Estate, A-R-E, uh, is the occupancy and dividend rate sustainable? The answer is yes. This is all organic growth. Occupancy only is below 100% or 99% when it's a, a new development, and they're basically going to stabilize rent. Uh, Omega Healthcare, we do not cover them. And there was a clarification on Well Tower, ticker is W-E-L-L. -L. Um, did you say avoid? Uh, it's a whole recommendation. It's within mostly senior housing. Um, we do think they're trying to climb, climb out of that with investments in life sciences. Um, so it's a whole. Kessie, with that, let's go to the last slide. Certainly, we, we appreciate you taking valuable time from your day to be with us uh, to talk about uh, real estate and REITs in particular. Uh, we want to give you a heads up on upcoming webinar, October 8th, CFRA sector's view on November election and the impact uh, if Biden wins or perhaps if Trump wins. And uh, we got a great lineup. We have Sam Stovall, Chief Investment Strategist, uh, Garrett Nelson, uh, automotive analysts who will talk about these topics related to our webinar theme, but he also covers Tesla. And Elizabeth Vermillion, who covers industrials and uh, areas related to machinery and waste management. So very fascinating period right now, focuses on the election. Most important for all of you is to stay safe and healthy out there. Any questions either about upcoming webinars or research, take a look at our uh, website addresses below here. Thank you again for all your time today.